This isn't live, is it? Uh, no, 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 not live. <laughs> no, don't worry. <laughs> We're going live in three, two, one. Right, guys, welcome back into the Blowpile podcast. Today, we welcome Harry Koenig. Welcome, Harry. I'll let Joe do the, the whole introduction, as Joe knows Harry a heck of a lot better than I do. I uh, hope you enjoyed today's content. You'll have seen in the title what the general consensus of the podcast is going to be about today. Um, so hopefully you enjoy. And yeah, welcome. Joe, how are you doing? And I'll let you do all the introductions with Harry now. I'm good, Joe. How are you? Yeah, it's cracking on. Will is texting me. No, Will, today, go away. Joe. He's showing off his new haircut. So that's... Yes. Oh, yeah. Nice I forgot to mention that. <laughs> right. So we've got Harry with us. Um, Harry played in a European tour event this year. Was this year? Yes. Yeah. yeah, two months Obviously, ago. With so much going on, the world has changed so much, even I, I bet since that. Um so I just want to give Harry a bit of an introduction. So I know Harry, um, we played a bit of junior golf together. Um, we were from sort of rivaling counties. Um, and then we ended up at university together. Uh, we lived together in the, in the first year and in the, did we live together in the last year as well? Was it just the first year? I can't really remember now. We lived together definitely like the first day we were in a house together and then I moved out yep. after three. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Joe was too messy. <laughs> what? Um, <laughs> I think it was um, late two we, we lived with, wasn't it? And then was it third year? We, we lived together first, whole of first year, and then maybe third year again. I think we did a little bit in third no, year. No, we didn't. Certain. No, not third year. Didn't? Not third year. No, just first year. Anyway, so we, we were at university together. We played a lot of golf together um, over that time. I know we practiced together a little bit during that time as well. Um, so obviously it was cool seeing your kind of progression now. You went down the route of keep playing. I went down the route of doing sort of a, a teaching pro sort of idea. Um, Harry was a lot better than me as well at that point, so I you know, could quite happily hold my hands up and say I made the right decision there. Um, but then you went off and played some Europe Pro and then Minotaur. Um, yeah. And then give us a bit of an idea. So the Minotaur, tell us a little bit about it um, and tell us then how that led on to you playing European Tour. Yeah, so um, I'd, heard, I'd heard a bit about Minotaur. Um, I knew a few lads who had played it and it had actually stopped for 2018. So its final year was 2017. They had a year off in 2018. Um, and then the start of 2019, you know, I thought, OK, I'll, I'll do the Q score. I heard it was going to come back with a really good prize fund. Um, a lot of good players were going to be playing. So I thought, I'll do the Q school. Um, did the Q school. Um, got my card easily enough. Played a couple at the start of the year, which went OK. I made, made both cuts. Um, and then it has the whole summer off because uh, the kind of courses they play over there, it's 40, 50 degrees in the summer in Dubai, Abu Dhabi. So you just can't play. So they play at the start of the year, at the end of the year. Um, and then played at the end of the year. Again, played okay. I'd make all the cuts, but just wasn't having any great finishes. Um, I qualified for the season-ending tour championships, uh, where the top 60 on the order of merit go to the tour championships. Um, funnily enough, I was number 60 on the list, um, on the money list. Um, and, and uh, yeah, went to tour championships. Um, I ended up winning that, and off the back of winning that, that got uh, that got an invite into the Dubai Desert Classic at the start of this year. So that was pretty pretty special. There's not many mini tours that give you European tour invites, especially European tour invites like like that one. So yeah, that was incredible. Yeah, and not not, not exactly that. expected either. It wasn't really on my radar at the, at the start. A pretty cool experience. I know that from something, I think I was just, I don't know if I saw your scorecard or something, didn't you have a pretty amazing last round or last nine or something to actually qualify? Yeah. Just tell us about that. Yeah, so um, first day I had to shot one under, which was not, it's, it's a pretty hard course. It gets super windy there, like in a four club wind. Um, second day I had a great finish, birdied five of the last six for seven under, um, which was really cool. Um, Birdied the last, which is like this really tough par four. I normally make like a double on it or something. Um, it's like <laughs> a driver four iron for me. Um, and then the final round, I was tied for the lead um, at eight under. Sorry, maybe one back. Um, got off to an okay start and then just completely lost my swing. I went bogey, bogey, double. Um, and then at that point, uh, how many back was I? Um, 
maybe seven seven behind, something like that. And I'd like properly lost my swing, like hit a few absolute skank balls, and like <laughs> it's normally, yeah, normally find it quite hard to come back from that. Um, and then I hold a third shot into a par five from about 100 yards and then had a great back nine, finished birdie par, birdie, birdie, birdie. Um, on the last, again, I hit driver four iron to, to this par four and hit it to less than a foot, which was, which was pretty awesome. It wasn't the best strike in the world, but <laughs> it, it got wow. there in the end. It's a little low Healy. No, Healy one that had the right shape to get up the green. Um, but yeah, it was a relief when it was a gimme away. Um, and there were four other guys who were on the last hole at 11 under and all four of them made bogey to go back to 10 under. And I was on 10 under and made birdie to go to 11 under. To, oh, awesome. Wow. That's like a movie. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was pretty unexpected, really. That's um, awesome. What happened so you, you've gone from not being able to find your swing midway round to then suddenly making all these birdies. What happened? What, what was the change? I don't know. Um, well, that par five, the ninth, where I made eagle, I didn't make a good drive, missed the layup with a seven iron and then hold the shot to a tricky pin. And I think I kind of thought at that point, like, you know, you don't always have to start making great swings to produce good golf you know sometimes um things can just go for you and i was like i'm just going to make something happen um and that kind of settled me back in because i was three over three or four over for the round at that point um and then that kind of settled me back in um knew there were a few chances coming up and then started holding some putts really which is always the main difference absolutely yeah absolutely and then obviously then you get your start on the european tour so you win the event there um yeah get your start on the European Tour. Just give us a bit of an idea about the build-up. Did you change anything leading into the European Tour event or, or just talk to yeah, us a bit about it a week before? Yeah, so I've been, I've been like injured really for two years almost now. Um, really struggled with my back, lost a lot of speed and strength. Um, and the plan was after the Tour Championships, which was the end of November, just to lock it down for a few months, to not play, recover, build my strength back. And, and well, I was really going to reassess if I was going to carry on playing, to be honest. Um, I wasn't sure if I was going to be able to carry on playing. Um, anyway, I ended up winning that. Got a, got a few invites. Um, I got invited the two weeks after that, actually, to the Indonesian Masters, um, which I, I didn't play because I, was, I just wasn't fit enough, which is a shame because it would have been a great event um, to go and play in. But there we go. And... So from winning that, I kind of realised, right, well, I can't lock it down now. I need to prepare and get ready for, for Dubai. So, which was, it was obviously amazing, but it kind of scuppered my plans a little bit to, to um, you know, get in a good place. Um, yeah. And I kind of paid for that in the last couple of months. I've just not had any rest for like a year and a bit, really. Um, but this lockdowns kind of um Help. yeah yeah a little bit so this is now this in is a, in a twisted sort of way time. it's helped you yeah yeah for sure so i i uh, went straight from i was planning to spend south africa christmas in south africa with my girlfriend's family and the golf out there is awesome so i went pretty much straight from jordan to tour champs to south africa and had like a month of prep out there um, had like new clubs to try out and that was a bit of a nightmare sorting that out so getting golf don't ever try and send anything to South Africa so I got them sent to South Africa and they just held the clubs and they just refused to let them go until I paid like vast amounts of money withholding tax and stuff which was just so annoying but um, managed to get them in the end and didn't didn't have enough time really to get used to them before the event but you know what can you do you've got to you've got to change clubs at some point my clubs are all so old you know, over three years old say, it was the same ones you were using at uni yeah i think like so. you had not changed sticks and i couldn't believe it when i saw the picture of you with these clubs again i was like oh my god i played yeah. against using those clubs what is happening here i know they yeah. must have been... they're pretty battered so yeah i had a 
had a really good month prep in South Africa. Um, I played a few mini tour events over there. Had one like brilliant round, um, which gave me a bit of confidence with the new clubs. Um, so I was I was in a like decent place going into it, but again, I'd been planning to kind of lock it down at that point already. So I was like running on fumes really. Then talk to us a little bit about, um, so obviously when you then get out to the event, you have your kind of practice yep. round. I remember seeing loads of that from Ilsley um, in, the, yeah. in the beer tent, most of it. Um, yeah. But he was obviously All doing some stuff that, that, you, <laughs> that you guys were doing. Um, give us a little bit of an idea of what it's like to play the practice, you know, the practice rounds and then also talk to you about the night before the actual event. Um, so yeah, I flew from South Africa to um, straight to Dubai met um ash in the airport uh, ash mason you know him he's uh he's yeah. a performance coach now he's he's not playing as much um he specializes in wedge play and short game and i came he came out with me for the week it was really nice to have someone like him there um you know we did a little bit of work together and we just had a really good time and then jake weber cadby came out to, to caddy yeah. for me so the boys are pretty familiar with um and we just had a really good time really we just embraced it all um I, would, I don't get too like flustered by stuff so obviously at first when you're on the range i think the first first morning i was on the range next to bryson so um that was that was pretty <laughs> cool once you kind of get over the fact that everyone's got two arms and two legs you know you just kind of get on with your own thing um and you realize that they're no different they're not looking at you they don't they don't care about you and to an extent, like, why should you care about them and what they're doing as well? So, yeah, you, you, you're all human beings at the end of the day. And actually, that's, that's what I wanted to ask you. It, well, and kind of make a point to, to all the viewers is it depends on what kind of person you are um, yeah. on how long it takes you to get over the fact that actually this guy next to me might well be Bryson, but actually he's a human being. He plays golf and we both hit a ball around yeah. the field. Well, they're saying that Bryson was looking pretty like pre-human Neanderthal he had put on like three stone of muscle he was the biggest guy by a mile out there he was as he's standing with his back to me just his traps and like his back like I was shocked at how much size he'd put on I know they'd made a bit of a <laughs> bit of a thing about it in the media yeah. but I swear like he's the biggest guy there by an absolute mile but yeah absolutely they are all human um they're just very good with the golf club. Um, you know, you, you see some people and they look nothing like what you thought they'd look like or, you know, yeah, everyone's, everyone's human. Yeah. And I, I think, yeah. I think from what you've briefly explained there before we got onto this subject, I think you explained it really, really well. And the way you approach that event, obviously it's your European tour debut. Obviously you, you wanted to, obviously you wanted to do really, really well and, fully capable of doing well otherwise you wouldn't be there but yeah. i think you approached it in the right way as just embrace the whole event see what it's all yeah. about and go and enjoy yourself yeah no I, I can i can definitely look back on it and say i i did enjoy it and yeah i, I lapped it all up and you know i got a lot of advice from people before about it um and there's not many things i'd change if i play another one there's definitely definitely a few things I'll, I'll play I'll, I'll, I'll play a bit more maybe and I'll, I'll learn from my last time but I don't think I can regret not doing that because you don't know those kind of things until you do it yourself and it's all good and well so someone's saying to you but you've, you've got to learn those things yourself really yeah. long, I mean, it might be a stupid question but long term goal is to make a career on the European Tour yeah yeah, that would be nice. Um, yeah. I'm planning. To, I've never been to, to Q School, but I'm planning to go at the end of this year. Although I'm not sure it's even going to be on. So oh, yeah, that's that's why I avoided yeah. the the kind of short term yeah. goal at question. Yeah, I think it's tough for everyone at the moment. No one, everyone's kind of got to reassess a little bit um, yeah. what they're doing. It's really tricky for a pro golfer because it's when you like or pro sports and when you build up for something, you know, you're ready to play. And to be told, basically, a year of your life is being put on hold now. It's a long time. Yeah. Um, and not everyone has a year to yeah. keep playing and keep going. A year's like, it's a lot of time. So you just got to have faith in yourself and what you're doing. 
<laughs> all those cliches. <laughs> yeah. Do you want uh, to lead on to a few questions on, from? Do you want to, do you want to lead on to a few questions from people we have on our social media list? If you yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, so, go on, um, we've got. Uh, we got one from Wilt, which was, what's it like traveling uh, week to week, obviously going to different events? You know, what's it like? How do you, how do you cope with that? Um, traveling. So when I pl playing the Minotaur is the best example of that. And that was the first time I'd kind of experienced what it's like to play on a proper tour. Because I played Euro Pro and a few other bits, but playing on Minotaur, you're actually traveling and you're flying and you're packing your suitcase and you're having to get a taxi to the golf course and sort your hotel out. So that's like proper proper traveling um it's okay i don't mind traveling i'm used to it i hate packing my bag um i just throw everything in and just hope for the best and i lose like you know two to three items every trip i go on so um as you can imagine from uni i'm pretty bad for that kind of stuff um it's tiring though and you don't actually you don't think it's it's tiring you think you're young and fit but traveling takes it out of you and every time i go to a tournament um I've got three practice rounds. I always see a trend in my practice rounds. I'm terrible the first day. Hit maybe a couple of good shots the second day, and it just gets slowly better. And it's, it's hard. I've got to tell myself that first day, you know, Harry, like, come on, it's always like this. You always struggle the first day when you've yeah. you know, been traveling a lot, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to trend as the week goes on. So it's hard to um, play pretty poorly. Um, and it's, it's amazing how quickly a game goes up and down. Um, from the traveling, I was going to say oh, that must be surely like, as your experience that say gets more or greater on the Minotaur. Let's say you keep playing the Minotaur, um, yeah. even if you're using it, you know, to, to um, gap sort of bigger events. Let's say yeah. when you get used to playing the courses, I guess you wouldn't need the three practice rounds, which means that actually, you know, the more experienced guys could rest on that first one, really yeah. take the time to recoup, get some rhythm, and then and then play yeah. one or even two for sure. No, for sure. I mean, when I say three practice rounds, I mean there's normally like three days when we get when we get there. There's day one, day two, day three, then the tournament. So I definitely won't play three practice rounds. I'll do something no. on each day unless I'm knackered, where I might completely take the first day off. But even just in practice, you know, I'd hit balls and I'd be skanking it a little bit. Um, <laughs> so I went I went from Egypt to Thailand for the final stage of Asian Tour School about a month month and a half ago. Um, and that was that was a really long haul flight, a couple of flights actually, maybe two or three flights. Um, yeah, proper net jets traveller right here, um, <laughs> budget airlines, and that that was tough. So it was like Egypt to somewhere, somewhere to somewhere, then somewhere to uh, Thailand, Bangkok. Then had like a four hour coach to my place I was staying, arrived at like stupid o'clock in the morning, couldn't find how to get in and just that was that was quite a, a long travel. Yeah, I was pretty pretty knackered after all that. Steven, did you want to ask your question? Yeah, um I'll ask my question. So of you don't necessarily have to have played with them, but preferably played with them. Of people that haven't played yet on the tour, you can include yourself in this three. Which three players haven't yet made it on the tour that you think will in the future? What kind of level are we saying? So uh, I'm talking, any, any I'm level talking at the moment. Euro Pro so, Challenge, Mina. Okay, so I mean, straight away it comes to mind. Um, ben Stowe's obviously, he's a pretty established player. He's not quite got his European tour card, but then again, he's, he's played you know quite a few European tour events now. Um, I think it's only a matter of time before he. He gets his full European tour card. He's come very close for like three years now. Um, so there's something, there'll be something for him that just doesn't quite click. And I'm sure as soon as it does, he'll he'll be fairly established on that tour. Um, so that's Ben. That's a really good question. Um, I'm trying to think meaner tour lads. Uh, there's a few lads on Euro Pro I've played with who, you know, stand out. Um, Played with Marco Pendridge a couple of times. Uh, he's very impressive off the tee. You won't see anyone who hits it further, really. Um, Richard Mantle, very consistent. Um, Todd Clements, I've played with him on Mina Tour a couple of times. He's a very solid player. Um, so yeah, there's there's a kind of group of guys I think that you'll that you'll see uh, yeah. 
He's, he's it was like, well, Ivan Pollock. Uh, is, it, is it George Bloor? Yeah, yeah, George. He's, he seems he's, like he's, the stuff he's won at the minute on, obviously we were playing the stuff out in Algarve and he's won like five out of the seven or something. Yeah, he won a few of those for sure. Um, I've not actually played with him. Uh, yeah, I did play with him actually as amateurs in, Port- in Portuguese Am. Um, but yeah, I've, I've not played with him recently, but from what I've heard, he's, no. he's a really good player. He's learned how to get over the line. Um, but it's yeah. funny, I remember the start of last year, we had final stage of Euro Pro qualifying school. Um, the weather at first stage was horrendous, and there were a few guys who didn't get through, and he didn't even get through the first stage of Euro Pro Q school. And I remember really? that. Yeah, he didn't even get through, had no status on it. And then there was a Jamiga Tour event, maybe the week after or week before, a week after or something like that. And, and they usually shot. one around that sort of time. Yeah, it was at Goodwood, and I remember he won it, and he shot nine under par first round, and everyone was like, oh, this kind of makes a bit of a mockery of the system when a yeah. guy who's not yeah. got through the first stage, because because it got reduced to one round, because the weather was terrible, um, you know, you've got someone who's well capable of playing at a very high standard, and because of the system, he's he's not got through, so I think they, <laughs> they have to have a rethink about that. <laughs> yeah. Um, just moving on then. Um, so my question was, there's, there's a lot of highs, obviously playing professional golf and things that you see that look all glamorous. You know, there's pictures of you on Instagram, you know, on the, on the putting green and I saw you signing some stuff for a few juniors on the edge of the green. Um, oh, yeah. this side of it, what are the sort of bad bits that people don't get to see? How long have we got? Um... <laughs> we'll make it brief. We can always do another episode on this if we need to expand it but just kind of give us a bit of a, a bit of a bullet point list uh, I guess just there obviously is correlation but there's just not always a correlation between the output to the output to what you get back in over a long period of time there is and you know if you do something very well for a couple of years you will definitely reap the rewards of it but I think you know you could have a month of really good practice and just not get a lot out of it. Um, I think it's pretty hard to pick yourself up from some, you know, with any sport, bad results when you're away in a hotel room, you really want to do well in something. Um, you know, picking yourself up from bad results is, is always tricky. Uh, I guess for some people, spending time away from home is hard. Uh, financially, it's, it's very difficult. Um, I was going to say, financially was always always for me the toughest thing I kind of feel like you know you spent 150 quid to enter the tournament 200 quid in a hotel for the week you know you're there oh, yeah. for two or three Best. nights yeah, you, yeah, you know, yeah. You, you, this is when I was playing in the UK and you, you drive to the event you play poorly and you come home and you're like I'm 500 pounds in maybe more and like I've gone and shot some horrendous score and I'm there thinking what, what am I doing yeah, I had a week like that a couple of weeks ago. I got an invite into the World Par 3 in Bermuda, which I was really looking forward to. Um, and I've, For some reason, I've had a really good Par 3 scoring average for about two and a bit years now, um, at like under three, which is really, it's really strong. It's like my strongest statistic. Yeah. And I was like, okay, if I just play my usual Par 3 average, that should actually be enough to win. Just, and it would have been. Um, and I get there. It cost a lot to be out there. The hotel was extortionate. I remember I got down to breakfast the first day. I had this lovely breakfast in front of the in front of the ocean. <laughs> and the waiter comes and he just slaps a bill in front of me. Forty dollars. And I was like, Oh no, 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 I think you've made a mistake. Um I've already paid for my hotel room. Um the hotel was very expensive. It was the only option. He was like, Okay, go to the go to reception to sort it out. So I go to reception. I say to the woman, oh, I've been given a bill for breakfast, but obviously I've already paid for my room, so breakfast obviously comes with that. She goes, oh, no, sir, breakfast not included in your room rate. And I was like, I'm paying $200 a night, and I've not even got breakfast included in my room rate. And she was like, sir, there's people paying a lot more in this hotel than you, and they don't get breakfast either, and just turned around and walked <laughs> off. So that, that was a bit of a nice moment like that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you, you, you get a bit angry at stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, I can imagine that. So we've got, um, I've just had a 10 minute timer come up now. So let's just fire in the last few questions quickly. Um, how do the courses compare on European tour compared to the other tours that you played? So let's say MENA or um, EuroPro. Uh, EuroPro and MENA tour are just set up for low scoring. Um, I think especially EuroPro, a lot of the courses, they're not very good. 
going to be honest. They were poor last year. Um, a few of them were good, but they're not. They're not set up. They're not demanding um, off the tee. Um, Minotaur, they're good golf courses. They're enjoyable to play, but they're not necessarily super testing all the time. Um, you know, scoring's generally fairly good, but it's good because you always should be learning how to get the most out of your game. Show on the par. Yeah. Um, the what the when I played in Dubai, um, that was probably the hardest setup I'd seen of a golf course, and it was amazing how they the European Tour can turn a golf course into such a challenge. Um, so I think the previous year Bryson won on twenty three under par, and they didn't want that again, and they brought the fairways in, which I've not really seen happen at a golf course ball, actually grow the rough up on either side. Um, they grew it up and they got the greens just rock hard. And all of a sudden, I think eight or nine under par won the tournament and the cut was mm. three, three over, which is the, the, you know, the highest cut they've ever had there. Um, it was just interesting, you know, I did hit it into the rough, not a bad drive, you know, a few yards into the rough. I couldn't reach the green from 160 yards, whereas you go and play 99% of golf courses, you miss the fair by a few yards, you know. It's, it's fine. So, it's yeah, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Not only you couldn't hit the green, you couldn't even get it in a good spot to to, to make par. So that was a bit of a baptism. Um, you know, very early on, I realised I had to learn that, that shot out of the rough where you missed the green and you've got to make that big swing and only carry it three yards. And that's, you just don't have any practice of that in England. Um, no. There's just nowhere no. where it's like that. And, and uh, so that, that was interesting, learning learning that shot, kind of US Open flop shot from three yards. So, yeah, definitely good to learn some new shots. Yeah, that, that kind of links into a podcast that I want to do in the future about different practice techniques. And yeah. actually being creative. In fact, Will, who kindly interrupted early on, um wants to talk about um different practice techniques so we'll get him on um because we did some chipping a few weeks ago before before the lockdown and we would we were going to different locations around the chipping green and we're trying to play different shots from the same place with uh with the same club essentially yeah so yeah well, we'll go into more depth about that but being adaptable is is kind of key isn't it to, to be able to play yeah regular professional goal yeah absolutely i think um yeah some i don't know some of the american players struggle adapting when they go and get on a lynx course um and having to use different options around the greens but most of them are so good that they are able to still do what they want with one club you know I've, i think jordan speaks a pretty good example of he generally does play with a lot of loft with his chipping and he's you know he doesn't use the bounce massively he really digs it in and gets it coming out it's kind of similar to Phil Mickelson almost but the amount of shots he can play high low skippy and checky with one club so even in that respect he's um yeah he can do a lot with it as well so I've got one last question just before we run out of time we've got five minutes um so we've got uh, a message from a couple of juniors as well. So we've got a couple of aspiring juniors, um, a couple of guys that I work with. They're only about 13. They're playing off about 13. Obviously, they're waiting to develop to be able to hit the ball a bit further. Um, what advice do you sort of have for them? Um, obviously, they're wanting to play full time. If you could have yeah. sort of one bit of advice, what would you have for them? I think just play as much as you can. Um, never, be, never be afraid to enter a tournament. Um, you see too many people say, I'm not playing that well at the moment. I don't think I'm going to play this week. Just, just play, play, play. Compete. Get, get used to competing and enjoying beating your friends, winning competitions, getting up at a junior open and doing a speech. Just play as much as you can. Play with good players. Um, so, yeah, just get used to competing, really. Yeah. And, hit it, and hit it hard. And there was something I saw actually that was that was really nice. Um, obviously, speaking about juniors and things, I believe that you sponsored a junior at your club. Yeah, two actually. Um, two so juniors. I've always, yeah, I've always had a really good relationship with a junior organizer. My club, Mark Sangster, he's a bit of a legend. Um, There's just something I thought I could. Do. I spoke to him. I said, "Are there any two juniors this year who you think would be really deserving of getting their membership?" 
and he thought of a girl and a boy. And I went up to the club and we, there was like a presentation at the annual general meeting and their parents were there and they were over the moon. So it was just a nice, um, a nice thing to do for them, I think. And hopefully it gives them a bit of like motivation to work hard with their game. Um, you know, we've got a WhatsApp group now, so just kind of keep, keep each other updated as to what we're doing. So they're both about 15 years old, I think. Oh, brilliant. Yeah, cool. Yeah. No, no it's I think not, that's a really nice match, that. Really nice. Yeah. yeah. yeah they're awesome. invested in their futures. You can, you can have them on the bag. Yeah. You can be on their bag <laughs> later on. <laughs> yeah, take potential of their winnings and they get better than me. <laughs> can I ask oh, you some questions? Right. Go on. Yeah, go for it. Got three and a half I've minutes. I've put myself on the spot. Three now. and a half minutes. <laughs> Where do you boys see the podcast going? Where do we see the podcast going? Well, I would just like to keep creating regular content. That's that's the only that's my only vision at the moment. Yeah. If people start to engage with it more and we get get more and more guests, yeah, who knows? Who knows where it might go? But regular content's enjoyable. It's not all that time consuming at the moment. I'd I'd love to make it time consuming. I'd love to make YouTube yeah. a thing. Um, yeah. But it's very difficult, very difficult. But at the moment, just enjoying it. Love it. Good. Yeah, I think for me, it's, it's something we just enjoy doing. Obviously, as you know, me and Joe used to work together. Um, we didn't fall out of touch by any means, but we weren't speaking as much. You know, we faced on the other occasion, but never really had much interaction. Um, and we were always kind of a pair that bounced off each other with sort of ideas and things. Um, so we thought it'd just be really nice to have this as something that we can use as a bit of a base and then to help yeah. our friends. So, um, for yeah, me, I'd yeah. like to see the, I, I love doing this sort of thing. I love getting guests on yeah, yeah. experiences. Um, you know, I'm hoping, as you say, I'm hoping to kind of get, maybe get Ben on board. Um, I'm going to try and ask, you know, Jackson Barr as well. Um, somebody played a little bit of junior golf with. So if I can try and get people oh, yeah, on. He's fine, huh? Yeah. So, you know, guys like that, if we can get you on board and, and get you in behind the podcast, I, I think it's brilliant. And, you know, hopefully people find this content interesting. Um, and obviously knowing yourself, it, it makes this sort of thing that, that little bit easier. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, you've got lots of time now, I guess, to, to do stuff. Absolutely. Yeah, people are more than happy to do it. Absolutely. Cool. Yeah. Thanks, Thanks very much for coming on. That's, um, yeah, that, if, I, if I say so, I think I speak on behalf of everyone. I, and I hopefully the viewers have enjoyed. I think that's the best podcast yet. Really good insight. I do. Um, and hopefully very useful for everyone. Uh, we are less than a minute away from getting cut off. So... Thanks very much for watching. Um, remember to like, remember to subscribe. Thanks again, Harry. Lovery, pleasure as always. And uh, we will see you in the next one.